My name is Tammy Ritzma. Uh, I'm on the faculty of the University of Nebraska PA program and also on the faculty of the St. George's University of London PA program in England. Um, and um, before I became a PA, I had my master's in public health and did um, different kinds of uh, health services and public health and medical research um, before I became a PA. And um, when I became a PA, I realized that not everybody had that background, that that was actually relatively unusual. And um, that within the PA education community, the experience with familiarity um, with uh, large scale data sets and large scale sort of NIH, CDC level research is pretty um, small. So I was hoping to share some of the things I've learned in the last 22 years with you guys. I know that there are a number of people that are doing dissertations or have interest in furthering their research. Hopefully I can help you with that a little bit. So why do research? These are ordered from sort of the least altruistic to maybe the most or the least motivated to the most, right? Somebody's making me do it. I need to get promotion. You know, down to I just love this stuff. I'm a data nerd, okay? Um, and hopefully you fall somewhere in that spectrum. All right? So there's types of different types of research to consider depending on your background and your interests. So, um, of course, PAs struggle a little bit, even compared with PTs or OTs, in that we don't necessarily have a content domain that is our own. If you're an HIV PA, you're interested in HIV. If you're a pediatric PA, you're interested in pediatrics. But there's pediatricians and infectious disease doctors. We don't own that content, and so it's been a struggle. And that's actually why you see a lot of people that are PAs who do research end up kind of up here in um, the, ooh, sorry, in the um, workforce, because that's sort of the one thing we own. Um, certainly, educational research is increasingly popular and increasingly important, right? We all used to just go to school, and that's the way it was done, and nobody evaluated it. And um, now we're being asked more and more to justify our approach to students and content. Um, clinical research, so again, if you are an HIV PA, if you are a pediatric PA, you might be getting involved with your team or even um, instituting your own study. And then um, fewer people do uh, participatory research or bench research. All right, there's two main data options in the world. Primary, which is stuff you collect yourself, and secondary, which is when you analyze data that someone else has already collected, okay? This talk is on secondary data analysis. Um, the advantages of primary data are many, okay? You can collect the exact data you need to answer your question in your population, in your time frame, okay? You can get exactly what you want. The downside is you have to actually collect that data, right? And that costs money. It takes time. You might have to supervise a research assistant. You've got to get it through the IRB. And a lot of PA uh, educators don't necessarily have the time for sure and possibly the expertise as well to go through the whole design process, the statistical planning process, the IRB, and then supervision of data collection analysis. So that leads to the advantages of secondary data, which is basically no cost for data collection, okay? There may be a small cost to purchase data. Some of the data on the handout I showed you costs about $75 for some of the um, National Technology Information Service stuff. But compared to what you could spend on research, $75, I think, is a fairly small amount. Um, usually IRB is not required because um, human subjects protection was considered at the time of data collection. Um, you get larger sample sizes. I just, well, you'll see, I, we published a paper where we looked at 168,000 people. I don't have the money, time, or expertise to collect data on 168,000 people. And it's nice because you get a great sample size and good statistical power. Um, disadvantages, the data may not answer your precise research question of interest. You may have to modify your question to be answerable by the data you have. This is not how you use public data. This is what researchers do, though, on a regular basis. What do you mean I forgot the semicolon in SAS? Okay, so I'm going to give you a practical example of a study that I did um, when I was working in the emergency department at Johns Hopkins Hospital. This is my colleagues at Hopkins. Um, we did this study called the National Trend of Quality of Emergency Department Pain Management for Long Bone Fractures. And um, what we did is we analyzed the national um, 
Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, Emergency Department Division, okay? Um, and we knew of this data set, and so we had to formulate our questions that would be answerable by this data set. So anytime that you're trying to do a research project, you need to formulate your question first. So these are some of the questions we had. Who gets good pain control in the ED? Who gives good pain control in the ED? Under which circumstances do they get it? And how is that pain actually assessed? Well, I actually can't answer those questions using that data set. I have to refine these questions. So we looked at the questions that are asked and the way the data was collected. And this is, as you can see, the 1999 through 2000 HAMSIS emergency department record. So I looked at this and I said, well, what do we have here? Oh, we can tell if they came in by ambulance. Is it related to injury or poisoning? Does the patient belong to an HMO? Okay, these things seem random, but they all have history behind them. Okay, so we looked at this. And we thought, how can we answer the questions we want answered based on this data? Um, you need to ensure that you understand your study design. So you need to know from which population is the sample collected. This is a national study, right? But you might look at California data, or you might look at all the members of an HMO. So you need to think about who your population is and what you can learn from that and how generalizable it is. You need to examine the questionnaires and we'll do that in greater detail in a second, and know the assumptions made, what the protocols were, and then there's an issue of statistical weighting for national um, samples, where if they collect not quite a representative sample, they apply statistical weights to make it a nationally representative sample. The other thing you need to consider is what's going on at the time. When I was in, I'm gonna out myself how old I am. When I was in public health school in the fall of 1991, Okay, um, I had a professor who was working on a big AIDS awareness project for the city of Detroit. And on November 9, 1991, Magic Johnson, an original Michigan hero, announced to the world that he had HIV. And my poor professor's study was completely blown out of the water because she had no way to assess whether the billboards she had helped put up all over Detroit had actually raised AIDS awareness or the fact that a Michigan hero, worldwide known, famous basketball player, had just announced he had HIV. So you have to think about what's going on in history at the time, especially since all of this is going to be essentially retrospective from your perspective. So um, you need to think about, do they, um, are people going to talk about stigmatizing information, right? You might want to look at rates of sexually transmitted infections, but if it's an interview protocol, is that data going to be collected effectively? What trends are occurring and in which direction are those trends heading? Are we prescribing more of this, less of that? Are we um, using different kind of therapies in a different way? And then is data from the past and even the recent past still applicable to my question today? Um, all of these data sets have a lag time, sometimes two or three years from the time of collection to cleaning to public availability. Okay, so then you want to refine your questions after you've considered all these things, the external factors, the questionnaire, and um, that's usually governed by the way it's asked in the data set. You need to make sure, you need to get your friendly statistician on board, you need to make sure that you can answer this in a statistically acceptable way. Okay, so back to my original questions, instead of saying who gets pain control, we asked, does opiate administration for long bone fracture differ by race? Okay, instead of under what circumstances are opiates given, we said which patients with long bone fractures get opiates for pain control? Okay, and then this is a consideration of circumstances. On January 1, 2001, JACO made it mandatory to assess pain for all patients in hospitals. So we had to think about does the assessment of pain potentially drive the treatment of pain, and will there be a difference based on that? So um, I've highlighted here the questions that we ended up looking. This is the 1999 through 2000. And here they're asked about their pain level, their diagnosis, this is where we got their long bone fracture, the medications they got, and then which type of providers they saw, okay? Here is the 2001-2002 survey. Hmm, where's pain? They took it out. 
just at the time they instituted the pain assessment. So we looked at 2003 and whoop, hello, there it is again. All right, so now I wanted to ask myself, did pain control get better after the 2001 initiation of the JCO standard? But I don't have that data for 2001 and 2002. Shucks, okay? So here's what we did. Well, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. When you look at these surveys, there's a massive temptation here. It's called data dredging. Who knows what data dredging is? Nobody? Okay, one person, good. Okay, data dredging is where you just put everything in a statistical model and run it and you see what comes out statistically significant and you publish it, okay? That is not cool, okay? You need to have a hypothesis, right? A scientific hypothesis that meets what we call face validity, something that makes sense, a biologically plausible, plausible mechanism, okay? Um, you also need to know that you cannot prove causation from this kind of secondary data. So that, again, that's what people do. They put it all in a model, they see what pops up, and they try to publish it. Dangerous, okay? And then you want to beware what's called multicollinearity, confounding and interaction. Multicollinearity collinearity is famous on this kind of analysis. What people do is they, they look at the rate of heart attacks, for example, and then they say, well, what predicts that? And they put hypertension in the model, diabetes in the model, hypercholesterolemia in the model, depression in the model, smoking in the model, and then they run each of those individually against heart attacks, okay? But the reality is those are all factors that interplay with each other. And if you don't account for that um, in a statistical model, you're gonna come up with, with results that seem so great but aren't true, okay? So maybe hypertension isn't the biggest risk factor, it comes out biggest because it's the most associated with the other things, such as diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. So get your local friendly statistician on board. Okay? Then you need to go obtain the data and the code books. So it usually comes in ASCII, which is just flat, tab, or um, common delimited files, or Excel format. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit more. You can actually get it as a SAS file or an SPSS file. Um, but you're gonna may have to convert it to whatever statistics you use. Then you need to make sure they'll have README files, which are all the assumptions, all the exceptions, all the way they coded. Like, did they code diabetes type one and type two together? You know what I mean? Did they did they do primary and secondary hypertension together, or are those separate? It has all the juicy details to help you. So don't forget to download those. And then um, a lot of times uh, the CDC particularly is excellent about actually giving you statistical code to input and to run some of the basic functions of the data. Okay, do not reinvent the wheel. These people have done that work for you for free. Well, your tax dollars, but basically for free, okay? Um, so bring those in and save yourselves a lot of harassment. I will just tell you this, this is important. I've had this problem a little bit at Nebraska, but it's easily fixed. Sometimes your institutional um, IT filters don't allow you to bring this data across. It's so simple. You just call your IT guy up and you just say, I want to import this data. When they look at the website and realize it's a legitimate site and it's legitimate data, they'll just take down the filter for you, help you import it and put the filter back up. So just get your friendly local IT professional on board for that. Okay. So this is just a screenshot of the National Ambulatory Care and National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey uh, from the CDC. And you can see it has all this, here's the instruments, here's the scope and sampling design, the estimation procedures, all this stuff is right on there. You just click the link for the one you want. And you get, you get something that looks like this when you click the link. So this is the 1992 data, the 93, 94, 95. And then, I don't have a screenshot of this, but you'll see the exact same thing, ed2009.readme, or ed2009.input, okay? So you can get all of this right off the website. Now, data analysis. Unless you are pretty good at stats, or you have a stats-savvy collaborator, get someone to help you. These are huge data sets. 
They can be a little bit tricky. They're very rewarding to work with. It's fantastic, but get somebody to help you. I will say, you know, th this is something I've definitely done before, is find a PhD student. Or the other thing is if you can find somebody like in the stats department or biostats department, or a method savvy person in another department who's really hungry for a publication, I kind of just took advantage of somebody like this recently, um, who didn't have a lot of, uh, he has long-term research going on, but kind of nothing coming out, and his chairman was pressing him to get something out this year. Um, he did that work for us for free, just as a co-author, um, because he needed to get a short-term, quick-hit publication. All right. So once you um, run your data, you need to go back and step back and say, does this make sense, right? If your data shows that <clears throat> people who work out three times a week who are never smoking vegans are 17 times more likely to have a heart attack than an obese smoker diabetic, there might be something wrong with your code, okay? So, so put your common sense hat back on and think about this. All right. Now, here's our study again. So as you recall, we looked at um, patients with long bone fractures in the emergency department and whether or not they got pain control and opiate pain control. And again, we could only look at comparing 1998 through 2000, which was before the initiation of the JCO requirement to assess pain. And we could only compare that with 2003. 2001 and 2002 were gone because they didn't assess pain, okay? And what we found that was interesting is in 2003, patients with mild or moderate pain were much more likely to get pain control than they would have in 98 to 2000. And same thing here for opiates. We found that patients with mild pain were much more likely to get um, opiates than they were in, um, in two, the earlier time period. And we kind of, for a second, we're surprised. Anybody want to guess why this in the end does make biological sense and why the severe was unchanged? Exactly right. If you have an open femur fracture, it requires no imagination on my part to guess that you are in pain. Okay? But maybe we got stoic Uncle Joe who fell off his ladder, right, and broke his uh, radius and ulna, and his pain is mild to moderate, and, you know, he's not going to bother that sweet nurse because she's so busy. But then the sweet nurse says, Uncle Joe, you having any pain? Well, as a matter of fact, I am. Okay, well, let me see if I can get the doctor to order something that for you. So we, we looked at this and we thought, you know, actually this does make sense. The levels of pain control for severe pain were already pretty high, there's not much place to go beyond that, but there is some place to go here. Okay. Once you've downloaded your data, done your analysis, okay, you're going to start to think about writing up. And I would say a big rookie mistake that I see is people write it up and then consider their journal backwards. Figure out your journal first because that's going to depend, that's going to influence heavily how you write this thing up, okay? So different journals have different audiences, and those different audiences have different interests. Um, you know, obviously Health Affairs does not publish articles about long bone fracture. Japamite, JPAE doesn't. NEJM does, okay? Health Affairs doesn't publish PA education articles for the most part, but JPAE does. So think about that, and that way when you're writing, you have your audience in mind. Is my goal to influence clinician behavior? Is my goal to influence policy? Is my goal to influence education? Think about that as you go. Um, as you're thinking about which journal, these are some good questions to consider. So which journal publishes on this topic? Who's the target audience? And then where is the conversation on this topic happening right now? 
Okay? So where have other people published about similar questions? So actually, um, we didn't publish it in JAMA, but JAMA has actually done a fair bit of stuff on um, the relationship between race and pain control, health disparity stuff. If we had kind of ended up there, which we didn't find any significant differences there, but that might have been a, a target place. Annals of Internal Medicine has done a lot of stuff on health disparities. That would have been useful there. Um, we published in Annals of Emergency Medicine, um, partly because, I mean, academic emergency medicine, partly because we wanted to reach um, educators of residents um, and PAs also uh, with, with that message about um, pain control and lung growth fractures. And then time from submission to publication. Some uh, journals have an extremely long pipeline. So they're like, yeah, that's great. We can publish that in two years. Well, if you have time-sensitive data, that's not helpful, okay? Um, and unfortunately, increasingly, journals are um, charging authors to publish. And so um, you might want to consider that uh, as you go on. I, I don't know if people saw the expose in Science Magazine about the um, open access journals that was recently published. Um, there are all these open access journals, and um, a guy at Harvard, I believe, um, made a, a fake study that basically any high school chemistry student would know was totally invalid and submitted it to 300 open access journals. And open access journals usually charge fees, and that's their business model. And um, something like 100 of the journals accepted it. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy. Okay. So as you write up, how are we doing on time? As you write up, uh, you want to consult the journal's website, okay? Do not send them a 5,000-word manuscript if their page limit is 2,500 words, okay? Um, you want to uh, format it properly. I literally got an article preliminarily rejected. It was ultimately accepted, but preliminarily objected, rejected because I separated my references in the in text citation with commas instead of parentheses. So they sent it back to me and said, do a replace with parentheses and send it back to us. It's fine. So, but they're not kidding when they say follow their formatting instructions. Know how many number, number of tables and figures are permitted and what their review process is. Then show this to somebody else. I'm begging you. When you have worked with this stuff so closely, you can't see the forest anymore. You're only looking at like the bark of like one half of the tree, okay? So please get somebody to look because things that are just blazingly obvious to you sometimes make no sense to a person who hasn't lived with that data for a while, okay? If you get a revise and resubmit for the journal, which is frankly the most common outcome, right? It's not usually straight up rejected or accepted perfectly. You need to seriously consider what the editors or reviewers have to say and respond politely. This is not the time to write a flamogram, okay? Um, respond politely. But I will tell you, it is absolutely okay. I just got an article accepted last week that um, one of the reviewers wanted me to add this entire section that really wasn't supported by the data that I had submitted kind of a policy implication. And I just thought it was a little bit of an overreach. So when I wrote back, I wrote back to the editor, if you as the chief editor want me to add a couple of paragraphs about this, I'm happy to do so, but I kind of think it's beyond the scope of this article. And I got a nice email back from the editor who says, yeah, actually, I see what you're saying, and you, know, you can push back against the reviewers a little bit as long as you have a reasonable argument to be made. Um, and then if you're rejected, read the comments that come with it carefully and figure out, is your study fatally flawed, like you use the entire wrong statistical methodology, or is it just it wasn't a great fit for that journal, you know, or you just got unlucky and you got an angry or frustrated reviewer, and figure out what you need to do to fix it. If you do need to send it to another journal, though, don't just send the same one. You've got to, again, think about it. Who's the audience? Who's the spin? What's the conversation? Okay. Where can I get some help? Right? I mean, I'm sure you guys share the frustration. We all, for the most part, trained as clinicians. This was like an afterthought in the curriculum a lot of times. People don't know how to do this. They don't have these skills, and yet somebody is demanding I'm like, you know, it's like you took a biology class and now your dean is giving you a test on Arabic. 
right? And you, you stink at Arabic because you never learned any Arabic. Or maybe you learned Asalaamu Alaikum and that's it, right? So um, you, uh, you need support. If you're fortunate enough to work in an academic medical center, a lot of times they have faculty development support, biostatistics department, faculty development conferences, people that are willing to collaborate. Most colleges, if you're at a liberal arts college, at least have a statistics department or a math department with a statistics subset. You can get some help from there. Um, PAEA research mentors program has kind of been hot and cold, but keep your eye open for it. And then I would say this is huge. You know, don't be afraid to reach out to potential collaborators that have more experience than you. People at your own institution or even other people within PA education. I mean, if you see names that come up over and over again in JPAE or JAPA, and you have an interest in common, don't be afraid to approach those people and propose a collaboration. I will say, don't call and say, I'd like to do some research. Do you have any ideas? OK, that's not going to get you too far. But if you have an idea that you'd like to pursue, I found PA educators to be unbelievably generous and willing to share their time and expertise. And sometimes all you need is somebody to help you refine your question. Sometimes you need a little advice on the IRB. It, it actually exists within our community. Just don't be afraid to reach out for it. Okay, um, and then you know, work with your, your colleagues. Sometimes maybe not, maybe somebody in your group has a little bit of better grasp on statistics and somebody else has done an IRB before and somebody else has a little bit of epi and you can kind of put it together. All right, so I'm gonna, um, you got your handout? I've got about 15 minutes on my watch, is that about right? Yeah, okay. Um, I realize I went through that really, really, really fast. So before we talk about this, can I just stop a second and find out if there's anybody that has any questions? I talk fast. I was a high school debater. I know I get a little excited. So is there anything people are like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what she said? You guys okay? People are still making eye contact. That's a good sign. Okay. Um, so here's a handout for you guys, okay? And this is just my review of um, publicly available data sets. And I've tried to include as much information as is practical in a handout. Um, but there are kind of several different things here. And I'm not going to go over it in super detail, but there's the workforce data sets. The National Ho Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey was the one I was just talking about. That one actually does specifically include physician assistance if you're interested in PA and NP research. The National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey below that, the problem with that one is the unit of analysis is the physician. Whereas in the um, National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Sur Survey, the unit of analysis is the clinic or emergency department. So the problem with the NAMSIS is that we're not physicians, and so we don't get collected. Now, I have moderately reputable gossip that the NAMSIS is actually going to change this, that there is somebody at the National Center for Health Statistics that really is realizing the limitations and is very open to consider um, collecting PANP and certified nurse midwife data. That's not going to happen anytime soon, but keep your eye open for it over time. Um, the AAPA census data, unfortunately, is pretty limited. Um, it, it hasn't been collected in a particularly reliable fashion, unfortunately, over the last few years, because there's been some turnover there. Um, so older data is potentially useful. Um, and you can read the rest. The national, the, I will say the Health Workforce Information Center is really interesting um, uh, for state-specific data. So if you're interested in state-level data, very, very useful. They do charge a little bit for their data, but it's not obscene, OK? Um, and the VA data is fantastic because the VA data has been, they have electronic medical records longer than basically anybody else, okay? The problem is, is that somebody you work with has to have a VA research appointment. So you can't just go and ask them for their data. You have to work with their existing cadre of collaborators. So again, if, it's helpful if you work in a um, large academic medical center, you're likely to be able to find that person at the VA near you. Um, but that's the one downside. If you can get it, it is absolute gold. They have data at the most granular level imaginable. Clinical data sets, if you're interested in clinical stuff, there's the National Health and 
Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES. Everybody's heard of NHANES, okay? Incredible data since the 60s, right? So if you're interested in obesity research, if you're interested in any kind of nutrition research, if you're interested in basic measures of health and how that changes over time, NHANES is an absolute gold mine. The only thing about it is it's such a gold mine, you definitely need a statistician. This isn't for the, this isn't for the newbie, <laughs> okay? National Health and Interview Survey, same thing. And then um, I'm gonna go to this, other large federally funded health studies. So um, I used to work on two studies. One was called the, um, excuse me, the Multicenter AIDS Cohort Study, and the other is the Women's Interagency HIV Study. These are the largest male and female cohort studies for the study of HIV in the country. The um, men's study has over 7,000 participants that have been followed for 31 years. And the women's study has um, 3,500 participants that have been followed for 18 years. And so the, the data is incredible. It's all collected longitudinally. So you can look at an individual over time. Um, by federal law, since we were federally funded, we are required to release what's called a public data tape three years after the data is finalized. So basically the investigators get the first three years to play around with it however they want exclusively. But after that, it has to be let out to the public. These are incredibly rich data sets. You too can analyze the Framingham Heart Study. Did you know that? Just only up to the last three years. You can't analyze that part because Harvard gets to hold on that for right now. Um, the last time I checked, a download from the NTIS was $75. I have to admit I didn't like check yesterday, so maybe it's a little bit more. But it's not $2,000, right? It's going to be somewhere less than $100 or $150. So if you're interested in um, uh, clinical data sets, uh, the Women's Health Initiative, any of the big studies that you can think about, you can get these publicly available data sets for a small cost, okay? Um, some of the larger insurers and in HMOs, um, when I was at George Washington, we had a collaboration with Kaiser of the Mid-Atlantic. Again, fabulous granular data sets because they've been using EMR almost as long as the VA. Um, again, sometimes you, you, you have to work as a collaboration. You can't just ask for their data, but you can ask to collaborate with one of their stat, stats people. And then educational data sets. So your PA program may be collecting great data and it may be going unmined. I actually, I think I'm hearing about this more and more. Um, ARC, right, is mandating that people collect data on their program, but they don't always know what to do with it, okay? So collaborate with people and think about it. And then the other thing I would really encourage people to do, um, I'm a, on the JPA editorial board and over lunch I had to go and look at the posters for potential publication in JPAE. And I saw a lot of fantastic, innovative curricular ideas presented on these posters, but almost none of them had pre and post data. We get excited about our new educational intervention and we don't think about maybe we should do some pre-testing to understand do we actually see a change or is it just the students thought it was a cool session and they really liked it. So as you're thinking about making curricular changes, Take one additional step and say, how could I analyze this? How could I assess this? Get some help from an educational researcher to sort that out, because then it's potentially publishable. Um, and also, I would put out a personal plea to consider multi-institutional studies. Much, much, much more generalizable. People legitimately criticize the PA education research out there because they're almost all single institution studies. With 181 institutions, I think there has to be somebody whose curriculum matches yours enough that you could share something with. So consider that. And this conference is an amazing place to meet people um, who are doing similar things that you could collaborate with. Um, there's some PAEA data reports. And um, the other thing I will just show uh, as a proud University of Michigan alumna, um, the uh, Institute for Social Research, it's on the bottom of page five. Um, the University of Michigan has one of the largest, longest standing institutes for social research. They have over 50 years of data. A huge, huge percentage of it is public. They survey everything from like 
what color car are you going to buy next, to what brand of toothpaste do you like, to who are you going to vote for for president. It's all across the social spectrum. But they have um, fascinating data. And again, the, the less recent data is available for free. So I don't think, ooh, I went the wrong way. All right. I would like to say two more things. One is special thanks to all these people. When I designed this um, session over a little over a year ago, I put out the call to people that I knew that were researchers to tell me a little bit about what they would like to have you told and also what data sets they like to use. So these people were very kind and gave me that input. Those names are probably familiar to some of you if you read the literature on PAs. Um, the other thing I would like to say is I'm going to shamelessly plug, we have a what's called research directors retreat at 3.30 p.m. in the cockerel room. And um, don't be put off by the title. We just had to pick a title. I don't like research coordinator because I was a research coordinator when I was 18 and like calling people to schedule them for their ear appointments. So uh, we chose research director, but you don't have to have that formal title at your institution to come. It's a great place to come and meet other people that are interested in doing research within their institutions. And we're just going to... Um, do some activities and network a little bit. I'm, I still got a little bit of time. Questions, concerns, things I totally forgot to say that somebody's gonna help me out with. This is like a blizzard, full on, yeah. Yes. That is, and that is absolutely the key to a secondary successful, a successful secondary data analysis. You can only answer the questions they asked. You can only analyze the data they collected. And you have to be honest with yourself about kind of in the spirit in which it was collected, right? Don't prod and torture your data too badly. You want to... Um, you want to be, you know, we all want to be honest researchers who fairly represent. So that's the downside. The upside is that some of these data sets are so vast and the data is so granular that you can actually really answer a huge number of questions um, based on your own hypothesis. Anybody else? I really appreciate your attention. I hope that you'll take the time to evaluate the seminar, so.